All right, we're going to pick up the story now in Genesis chapter 12. And this is a fascinating passage of Scripture for several reasons. It's interesting um, thematically in that we see here information that will be important for the entire rest of the Bible. Really, uh, what we see here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, sets us up for the entire story, not just of the Israelite people, but if you understand it properly, also for Christians today, so that the whole of the Bible somewhat can be pointed back to uh, Genesis chapters chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. What it gives us here is a setting of the stage for everything that will follow. And so it's interesting for that reason. But it's also interesting dramatically because you see um, this change from this great promise that is so uh, epic as we read it, so far-reaching, so global in its application. And then you find almost immediately after that, we see uh, you know, this setting out of Abram and his family, but then some, uh, some what we might call distrust or uh, testing of faith, which some would argue Abram did not pass. And so this becomes a very interesting passage, not just thematically, but also dramatically. And it's also just interesting in terms of some of the geographic elements and historical and archaeological things and cultural things that we see happening in this passage that that are um, helpful. There are also uh, a couple of motifs that become interesting as we read. So let's go ahead and begin to look at this passage together. I'll begin reading in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he had departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had prepared uh, to him, sorry, who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Now we're going to talk about this first section, and we're going to focus first chronologically, obviously, on this promise that is made, this covenant that is made with Abram. Now, This covenant appears elsewhere and sometimes with different levels of detail. It's also given to Isaac and to Jacob, or at least reaffirmed to Isaac and to Jacob. And the interesting thing about this, first of all, is that we need to see that um, there are some chronological issues that have to do with when this happened and where he was when he received this. That becomes very important. So, If you look back at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31, it says, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur. Now that makes it look as though that this whole operation was Terah's idea. Terah was leading the caravan on the way to Canaan. However, um, it tells us in chapter 12, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country. So it, we find out in chapter 12 that it was actually Abram's idea because God had spoken to him and told him to do this. Now the question then becomes, when did God tell him this? Did God tell him to leave and go when he was still back home? Or was it when he was in Haran? Because it tells us, 
that in chapter 4, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So if you just go with chapter 12, it appears, if you just read this from chapter 11, verse 31, on through chapter 12, verse 3, uh, it looks as though Terah had this idea of moving the family to Haran. And then in chapter 12, it looks like Abram leaves from, Har- here's this promise from God, this covenant from God, and then leaves Haran and goes forth to Canaan, as if Haran is the family homestead when he receives this covenant. However, that is not the case. Because if you go to Acts chapter 7, and Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7 verse 2, And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So we find out from Stephen, and he tells us that this promise came before Abram or Terah or any of the family left Mesopotamia to go to Haran. So uh, then the question just becomes, why did Terah go with him? It seems that the only way to reconcile this, to make sense of this, is that Terah decided that when um, Abram left, that Terah would just go with him. They would just pack up the family and move along with Abram. It has struck the minds of a lot of Bible teachers and Bible commentators that this was not what God wanted. In fact, it doesn't seem like it's even what God told Abram to do because it says specifically Um, that Abram is to leave his father's house, leave his relatives, leave his father's house. But he didn't leave his father's house. He left the geographic region they've been living in, but Terah, his father, and the whole house went with him. And so this doesn't seem to match up with what God had commanded for him to do. Now, there are several reasons why Terah may have wanted to go with Abram. One of those reasons is that... um, By leaving, Abram was giving up a lot. He was giving up ancestral property rights. He was giving up his inheritance. He was uh, giving up this uh, whole relationship of burying your father in your father's land and then uh, you being buried in your father's land and all that sort of thing. He was giving up a lot of things we know culturally when he decided to leave his father's house and to go out. So his father, we can imagine, we don't know for sure exactly what the circumstances were, But we can imagine his father kind of, um, uh, he and his father having a back and forth about this and uh, this being problematic for his father uh, and the resolution being, well, I'll tell you what, I know know you're saying that you're supposed to leave and and go. I'll just go with you. That'll solve everything. I'll just go with you. The house will just go with you. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that Terah actually had become a follower of Yahweh, a believer in Yahweh the one true God. Now, you might have thought, well, how do we know that Terah wasn't already a worshiper of the one true God? Well, that is a matter of some debate. In fact, some people think that they found a contradiction in Scripture as it relates to Terah's faith. Because in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So we find out from Joshua, uh, he had information that he was privy to that Terah had at one time worshipped other gods. Now you say, well, what's the contradiction? Doesn't seem like a problem to me. Well, some allege a contradiction because in Genesis chapter 31, we find out uh, from Laban, Genesis chapter 31 and verse 53, Laban is working out a deal with um, Jacob here. They're working out a truce, a little bit of a covenant here themselves. And in the midst of that, Laban mentions that the God of Abraham is the same God of their father. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. Well, that's associating Terah with the God of Abraham, the, the one true God, Yahweh. Now, a couple of things about this. Number one, it is possible that, first of all, there there needn't be any contradiction in Scripture here. Uh, For one thing, it could well be that Terah went with Abram. This is really the point I want to make. could be that he decided to go with Abram because he had become convinced that despite his history worshiping false gods in Mesopotamia, that Abram's 
God was the one true God. In other words, he believed Abram, believed his testimony about Yahweh, speaking to him, making a covenant with him. And so for that reason, wanted to go. He says, hey, I want to be a part of this too. I believe in that God. I'm going to worship that God now, so I'm going to go with you. That's one possibility. It could well be, though, that um, the previous explanation that I gave that maybe he just, because of these rights, these inheritance issues, uh, just wanting to keep the family together, that Terah decided to go with him for that reason, but still worshipped uh, these other gods. That would clearly explain, uh, that would give another motivation for God wanting Abraham to leave his father because he wanted him to get away from the worship of these false gods. And the way you would square that with what Joshua and Laban say is that um, Joshua tells us that Abram worshipped or that Terah worshipped uh, false gods. Laban says that this God, Yahweh, is the God of Abram and of Terah. But it may be that Laban is just wrong about that. You say, well, yeah, but it's in the Bible. Well, okay, it is in the Bible, but understand that the Bible records the words of liars uh, with great regularity. Uh, the Bible records the words of Job's comforters, for example, who are giving information that is contained in Scripture uh, that we find out later from God was wrong, that these comforters of Job were wrong. We're not saying that Scripture was wrong. We're saying that Scripture in telling the story records the words of men whose words are wrong, you see. In fact, Scripture has the words of Satan in it. Um, who is obviously the father of lies. So it could be that Laban was just wrong about that, and uh, he was associating, maybe he didn't know, maybe he was confused about Tara's past, maybe he just didn't know. So there are several ways to look at this, but so what I want to give you is one explanation for Tara's going with Abram could be that keeping the family together and working out just the natural way of things as it relates to um, issues uh, of inheritance and property rights and all of that. Another explanation may well be that Tara became a believer in Yahweh and so wanted to go with him for that reason. Uh, it's hard to say for sure because the Bible doesn't tell us for sure, but what we can work out by looking at what Stephen says and then looking at this passage here is we can see that, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, that Abram was told to leave his father's house when he lived in Mesopotamia. That's when he got the covenant. That's when he got the promise. But when he left, Terah went with him. And as we said in the previous lecture, the name Terah means delay. So it seems that that's exactly what happened. They got delayed in Haran. In fact, uh, we know that if you look at a map, you can just easily uh, look up an internet image of the map uh, of Abraham's journey here. Or you can look it up. Some Bibles have this in the backs of their Bibles where it has Paul's missionary journeys and other things. And you can see that Abram uh, in Mesopotamia was way far east in his father's house when he got this promise. Um, not really anywhere near the promised land. I mean, from our perspective, he was near the promised land. But from his perspective, and in the ancient world, he was a long way. And he went, uh, he went along you know, the Euphrates River, far up north and west from this eastern, I don't know if I said he was east, but he was east. And he went way far up north and west to Haran, above kind of, kind of north east, still a little bit, above the promised land. And then when Terah died, he departed from Haran, uh, and then he goes down, he goes way far down to um, into the promised land and all the way through the promised land, right? So the what I want you to recognize here is that this was a little bit of a uh, hang-up in Haran where he didn't exactly do exactly what God had told him to do. Now, you got to understand, we see in Abram, and we're going to see this throughout this passage, throughout this chapter, that there's going to be a hundred years of service where Abram is serving uh, God, serving Yahweh. And he, the Bible is realistic with its heroes. I mean, we all point to Abram as, as a hero of the faith. I mean, he's uh, mentioned later on as, as one of the heroes of the faith in the book of Hebrews. And um, we know that the Jews looked back on him as one of their heroes. I don't see any reason why Christians can't admire and think highly of Abraham uh, and how God used him to bring about this promise. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Nevertheless, Abraham, we see, Abram at this point, is a very realistic person. He's a person. He has flaws. He makes mistakes. 
though some will try to vindicate him and you know do contortions with the scripture and acrobatics to try and find a way that Abram didn't do anything wrong anywhere in this chapter, even with his wife Sarai, as we find out later on uh, with Pharaoh, the truth is he makes mistakes. And the Bible shows us that. And at this point in his life, it's very, very early on in his life. And he, we see him making all kinds of mistakes. Um, or at least we see him making several mistakes. I don't want to overstate it. Now, um, what else can we say about this promise? Well, now this promise, it, tells, it, does, it says it more specifically in the covenant as it's being recited later. But if you look down past the, the uh, usually in your Bibles, uh, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 12 are uh, kind of in a different form. They're indented, and it looks like the way that the Bible sometimes records New Testament in the New Testament, how it records Old Testament passages or something, depending on the Bible translation. Uh, but uh, after chapter 3, it goes back into kind of a narrative of what's happening. But down in chapter 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So this is a promise that is made to Abram's descendants. Uh, to, well, to Abram and his descendants. Now, some have said that the word descendants there is, is a, an unfortunate translation because the word in the original language is the word for seed. And the word seed is ambiguous as to whether it is singular or plural. And you say, well, what in the world difference does that make? Descendant seems perfectly fine to me. He's making this promise to Abram on the part of uh, his genetic offspring, uh, the Israelites that would come out of him, ultimately out of Jacob, the Israelites. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so this, um, this is a promise to his descendants. What's wrong with that? Well, some would take issue with it. on the base, And this actually is no small theological point because people argue about this even to this day. Who was this promise actually made for and to? Well, it was made to the seed. That's what we can all agree on. It was made to the seed. It was made to Abraham or Abram about his seed, uh, and to Abram and said, "To your seed, I will give this land." And uh, okay, so now the, the the important thing that we have to figure out here is who is that? Now, it might seem obvious to you because you have a history of preachers preaching on this and always just saying that, well, this is talking about the Jewish people, those people who are genetically Jewish. It has to do with their physical race, the physical race of the Jews. And for that reason, we want to make sure that we treat the uh, Jews today very well and that militarily, you know, the United States is on their side and all that kind of thing. And that, um, I'm not against that. I'm hospitable to that. However, the fact is there's more that we need to examine here than just that. For example, if you go over to Galatians chapter 3, go over to Galatians chapter 3 in your Bible if you have a Bible handy. And in Galatians chapter 3, Paul unpacks this a little bit. It says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 6, Even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Okay, so now Paul is making the point it's not so much genetics that makes you a son of Abraham. What makes you a son of Abraham is faith. Faith is the important feature. In fact, uh, it, it's always been the case that Gentiles have been allowed to come in among Israel, and they can even be a part of Israel if they you know, go through all the worship and the circumcision and all those sorts of things like the um, Israelites do. We don't have to get uh, circumcised today. That is also something that is important to this very letter in Galatians. Uh, but the important thing that I want you to see here is that it's the faith that makes you a true son of Abraham. In fact, we find this in um, Romans chapter 11. We see that uh, Paul turns his attention. We're going to come back to Galatians chapter 6 in just a moment. Um, but if you want to turn over to Romans chapter 11, you'll find that in Romans chapter 11, in verse 13, he says, But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Okay, now he's turning to the Gentiles. and He says, Inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. He's speaking to the Gentiles. In verse 17, he says, But if some of the branches were broken off, branches of what? Well, of this tree. This tree is Israel. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in, what? Being who? Well, the Gentiles. They can be grafted in. 
among them and become partaker of them, of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for the unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So the idea is uh, that uh, some people who are genetically Jewish are no longer considered a part of that tree. But some Gentile people, because of their faith, are grafted in as part of that tree. And of course, that's consistent with what we see in Galatians, also Paul, in chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And then, of course, if you go down to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. That is Christ, end quote. That's Paul. Paul is telling you that this, he's referring to this promise. And he's saying this promise was not made uh, to all these seeds. It was made to one particular seed, and that seed is Christ. So the promise is made to those people who would be a part of the covenant. And uh, Christ is now that covenant. And if you're in Christ, you're in it, and you're a part of that seed. Uh, and if you're not in Christ, you're not a part of that seed. So the uh, promise, that, this is what I want to point out, the promise that is made way back here is not just a general promise to all genetic Jews. It's a promise to faithful uh, Jews who are worshipers of God and who would uh, follow through on that and always be worshipers of God. And today that means they're worshipers of Jesus Christ. And we find out through the later revelation uh, I mean, it's, we even find out in the Old Testament that uh, Gentiles can become a part of the covenant. They can become a part of this and, and, and become part of the worship of Yahweh. And we find out that the same thing is true that was true in the Old Testament is also true in the New Testament. That Gentiles, by their faith, can become a part of this tree. They can be a part of this promise and a part of this seed. Now, um, so I, I just want to give a little perspective to that because, I, you know, in looking at this promise, this promise is far-reaching. All the nations of the world are being blessed. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who uh, curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is a far-reaching thing. Uh, I am not a part of what is known as uh, a movement called replacement theology, however, I just think that we have to understand that God made a promise that was a promise not just based on genetics, but was based on faith. And Paul makes this same point. So you say, well, is this some kind of racism? You don't think that this is specifically talking about uh, Jews? No, I think it is talking about Jews. It's just that it's not necessarily talking about genetic Jews uh, only. It's talking about people who are faithful Jews and people who are who become a part of that, <laughs> that uh, true faithful uh, Jewish line by faith, not just by genetics. Um, you know, when you when you think about this, this sounds so foreign to what some people think when they when they read this passage, and it sounds so different than what you might get from some um, popular television uh, prophecy preachers. But uh, the fact is that this is has some messianic stuff related to it. This is the way that that the whole world is going to be blessed. Is not just through genetic Jews. It's going to be blessed through what God ultimately brings out of that. And it's going to be bring Jesus out of that. And then through Jesus, uh, all the world is going to be blessed even further because uh, through the Jews, because Jesus was a Jew. But out of that, we're going to have faithful people who become a part of, who become associated with that seed singular that is Jesus. Now, you might say, well, then do you, do you not think that um, genetically Jewish people today are uh, have a special place in the heart of God? Do you not think that God uh, thinks something special about them? Well, you know, this comes up a lot. I, I don't quite know how to address that. I mean, uh, on the one hand, it is important to recognize that God uh, did choose to do what he did through the Jewish people. And I think, now, now here's where I'm just going to give you my opinion on this. And I always want to be clear when I'm giving you my opinion and a little bit of speculation rather than something that I can thump the pulpit and say, thus saith the Lord about. 
But I do think that even up until this day, we see some, th- some residue of God's um, choosing of Israel even to this day. Uh, we have seen some amazing things happen throughout the history of the Jewish people. We have seen a number of separate groups and kingdoms and leaders all the way throughout biblical history and history right up into today, particularly in the 20th century, with how uh, people have just wanted to persecute and seamlessly, uh, for almost no reason or no good reason, go after the Jews and try to destroy them and wipe them off the face of the earth and seemingly miraculous ways that God has delivered them, even at a time when the vast majority of of the Jewish people were not believers in in Christ. I mean, they they aren't. They never have been, not the vast majority. And uh, even today, the, the majority of them are secular people. But God has miraculously delivered them. We see interesting things in terms of the average IQ of Jewish people being uh, high, very high. We see uh, their influence in the world being profound, particularly in various uh, areas. You know, it's, it's thought to be almost racist if you point that out, but I don't know why. It's if it's racist, it's racist against um, those of us who are not Jewish. It's a, it, it props up the Jewish people. They they do seem to be mysteriously a special people. Uh, but yet they, most of them, are not in proper worship to God because that only comes through Jesus. You know, I, I want to be careful to say it's almost like some preachers today want to say, um, well, you know, uh, y- you can be lost or you can be a Christian. But if you're Jewish, it's almost like there's this third category that's, well, you're not really saved, you're not really a Christian, but you're not really lost either. Well, that is completely unbiblical. The truth is, if you're not in Christ, then you're not saved. If you're not in Christ, you're not in proper worship of God. I mean, modern Jewish people today don't even have a place to carry out proper Jewish worship as it is unfolded in Jewish uh, scripture in the Old Testament. They don't even have a temple today to go make sacrifices. The The Jewish religion was a, Jew, was a religion of animal sacrifice at a temple. Uh, which was, you know, basically amounted to a slaughterhouse where you would uh, do animal sacrifice and other forms of sacrifice to God. They don't even have a place to do that anymore. They are not in proper worship uh, to God. There's no way to, to 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 say that. So how then do you square with what seems like visible and historical evidence that there's something mysteriously special about these Jewish peoples? I think. That it is that, uh, of course, God is not done with the Jewish people. But on top of that, it's also that the residue of his blessing on them um, as a people is is just still lingering there. And it's still visible on them, uh, even at a time now where they have uh, 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 violated uh, their relationship with him. Some would say violated their covenant with him and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but I do just wanted to point out, I'm not, I don't believe in repl- what, have, what has been called replacement theology. But I do, at the same time, recognize uh, that this is a promise that goes farther than just genetic, genetically Jewish people. Now, it tells us after this promise that Abram took Lot and uh, some people that he had gathered there in uh, Haran or Haran, however you want to say that, and Sarai, and they took off, and they went down into Canaan, and they they came as far as the site of Shechem and uh, to the Oak of Mora. Now, we can say a couple of things about this. First of all, Shechem has been identified today as the site of Tel Balata, which is 35 miles north of Jerusalem, and it's near Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal which are going to be important uh, mountains there later on in the story, uh, later on in, in uh, Moses' writings outside of the book of Genesis. And um, this, this area it was mentioned, Shechem was mentioned in Egyptian texts from the 1800s B.C., and it was known to be a sacred site. Now, what's this business about the Oak of Mora? You know, it's almost like... Um, you know, in Moses' day, would this oak have even been still there? You know, what's all this about? Why, why is it important to mention this oak of Mora? Well, you got to understand that large oak or large trees of any kind uh, 
particularly if they had a reaching, you know, a reaching uh, branches that would go far out from them and provide shade. That was important in the kind of environment we're talking about, but also it was a sign of fertility in that land. A tree like that was kind of like a symbol of fertility for the land. But also it was a place where a wise person or a judge uh, would sit and um, or an advisor would sit and judge cases. We hear about Deborah doing that later on in the book of Judges. And so this is a, th- these, a tree like this is not just mentioning it because it's a, it happens to be a tree that some people knew about. People would have known about it and might remember talking about it throughout the, the you know, the family history or the history of the peoples because of its significance for all these reasons just mentioned. Okay, so these are interesting things we can say about Shechem um, and uh, the Oak of Morah. Now, the Canaanite was then in the land, it says. The Lord appeared to Abram and said uh, to your descendants, we talked about that already, I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. Now, Bethel wouldn't be called Bethel until later uh, during Jacob's life, but Moses knows that everybody knows this is Bethel, so he says Bethel. And pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built another altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Now, these altars become important because an altar is, we said this when we were talking about Noah, but an altar is like uh, your way of um, claiming the land for a particular God. So Abram can, uh, building an altar, is this is him going throughout the promised land, going throughout this area that would be uh, given to him by God or had been given to him by God. And he's saying, hey, this, this belongs to Yahweh. This is his land. I'm going to build an altar here so that everybody knows. I'm building this for Yahweh and uh, making sacrifices there. Now, it might have been a bit intimidating to the peoples of that area that here comes this guy with a great caravan of people that he got from Haran and then his own family and all of their servants, and all of their you know people that were with them, all this stuff that they're bringing through. And it probably looked like a, a kingdom coming through. And Abraham looked like a king. I keep calling him Abraham. You understand he's Abram at this point in the Bible, but we know who he becomes. But he's like a king coming through, and it would have looked that way to others. You know, uh, we hear about these kingdoms that are in Canaan, and we think we think about them as being the. You know, we think of a kingdom today, and we think about this vast. A uh, nation of people with a huge wall that goes around it. And of course, a lot of them did have walls going around them. But they're not vast by our standards today. They weren't large nations. They weren't these, you know, have hundreds of thousands of people in them. In fact, um, we've excav- excavated places like Jericho and found that they're only a few acres, you know, big in terms of the geographic space. So it almost looked like little towns with a wall around them. And uh, the people in those towns would have been about as populous as probably the caravan that Abram's coming through with. So it changes the way you think about these peoples, these kingdoms we hear about, particularly when you get into Judges and you talk about these, you know, uh, Joshua's going through, or Joshua rather, Joshua's going through and he's um, conquering these Canaanite kingdoms. And you think, all right, all these kingdoms, how big is this thing? You know, what's going on here? Um, you know, I, the promised land isn't even as big as we would think about to have all these vast kingdoms all in it. Well, that's be, that's because those kingdoms were not as big as we would think about them today. It's like a town and often was a military outpost, but it was a town with a wall around it and uh, something like that. So when he's coming through and building these altars, people are looking at this and probably don't know what to make out of it exactly. Um, and he might have looked a little bit intimidating to them. And they don't know what God necessarily, as far as we know, that that uh, Abram's building altars for. So what do you do with this? You know, <laughs> well, until you have more information, maybe you leave it alone. You know, we see uh, him interacting with kings and stuff uh, like Pharaoh here outside of that area in Egypt. But uh, here at this point, we just see him coming through and he's building an altar. But he's claiming he wants to build something that is permanent, an altar, so that everyone looking knows I'm staking a claim for my God. And it says there that he comes down 
to the Negev, which is a term that means the south. Or it's, it's like a term for the southern end of, of this area, the southern desert of Israel, what would become Israel, the southern end of the promised land. Now, if he had stayed there, perhaps that's what he should have done. That would have been maybe the end of it. But that isn't the end of it from what we hear here. We see that in verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See, now I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they'll kill me. But they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I might live, I may live on account of you. It came about when Abram came into Egypt. The Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore, he, uh, he treated Abram well for her sake, gave him sheep and oxen, and donkeys, and male and female servants, and female donkeys, and camels. Okay, now now we'll read the rest here in a minute, but what do we say about this? Well, why, first of all, why is he going down into Egypt? Well, the Bible tells us it's because there was a famine, and he had to go somewhere. But God didn't tell him to do this, and this is, well, as far as we know, God didn't tell him to do this. And a lot of people, myself included, see this as a little bit of a misstep. Um, it, if, okay, well, let's lay out the possibilities here. Either God told him to go down there, but he didn't trust God to take care of him, so he had to lie. Um, because if you're, if you're trusting God completely and you go somewhere, even if you think they might kill you, you tell them the truth. I mean, we mentioned Stephen a while ago, and since he's fresh on our mind in Acts chapter 7, you know, that's a good place to point out someone who um, probably knew as an educated, you know, um, Hellenistic Jew of his time that, that you know they're, they're likely to kill me for the way I'm preaching and yet he went ahead and preached anyway and he got killed because if you're trusting God you just go ahead and trust God that whether you live or die what's important is what God told you to do so if God told Abram to go down there he didn't tell him to lie and Abram went down there and he, and he lied so either God didn't tell him to go down there in which case uh, there was no reason he wouldn't have been in a situation where he would have had to lie or felt like he should lie, or God didn't tell him to lie, but did tell him to go down there. But either way, uh, I don't know how you vindicate Abraham in this situation. It looks like he messed up somewhere. There's some kind of a test of faith, and Abram failed or half failed or something because there was um, uh, there's some stuff going on here that does not reflect the nature of God. Why would he have gone down to Egypt because of a famine? Well, um, there was a, a water source down there, the Nile River. Um, this was a, a society of people or a group of people, a nation of people that would have had uh, plenty of resources for providing for you uh, food, water, whatever you would need in the midst of a famine. And so it would make sense to go down to Egypt. Uh, this it becomes a little bit of a trend uh, with uh, Abraham's children, either going to Egypt or there being a uh, desire to go to Egypt in the midst of hard times like this. So he goes down to Egypt and decides to err on the side of security. It would look like, at least that's how it looks to us. And when he gets there, uh, he says, "Tell them." He says to Sarah, "I tell them you're my wife. Uh, tell them you're my sister." Which, of course, we know is a half truth because we find out later that it is his half sister. Um, we find that out. In Genesis chapter 20 and verse 12, that Sarai is Terah's daughter. So it is true that it's his half sister, half sister, but it's his full wife, you know. And so he, but he does tell what we would call a half lie here, and it gets him into a whole bunch of problems. So um, he comes down here and he says, Tell him that, that, that you're my sister. So that's what she does. She doesn't challenge this, she just does as she's told. Um, she says, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm the sister. Uh, so um, they take her. The servants tell Pharaoh that there's this woman who's beautiful, and Pharaoh listens to them, and he comes, and he gets this woman, Sarai, and he takes her. Now, he doesn't marry her because it tells us in verse 19, why did you say she is my sister, Pharaoh says, so that I took her for my wife. 
Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Um, the idea being, I, I took her for my wife. I might have made her my wife. That is, I might have consummated this thing. I might have gone all the way. Um, he clearly didn't do that. Uh, he says, take her and go. Uh, there was a period of time in that day before uh, the consummation of a wedding with a king or a pharaoh. Uh, you had to go through a proper sort of uh, process of being prepared for that. According to Steve Gregg, that could take up to a year of bathing in certain spices and perfumes and preparing yourself for that day. So it's likely that, that nothing immoral actually technically took place. We know that nothing like that would have taken place for sure. But, um, what we, what, but this could have happened. And this possibility of the immorality is a frightening thought. So Abram told this half lie and his wife went into Egypt. Now, um, it's hard to resist the temptation to point out that Moses, in talking about this, would have known uh, that in his day, you know, God's wife had been taken into Egypt illegitimately. Uh, God's, God's wife had been made a slave in Egypt as a bride, and that being the children of Israel. A little interesting parallel there, right? You can preach on that. That'll preach. But the Lord struck Pharaoh with, um, or struck uh, Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, uh, let, let's say a couple of things about why is it that she was considered to be beautiful by Pharaoh? I mean, this is a woman who at this point in her life is between 65 and 70 years old. Yet the Bible says specifically that she's beautiful. And we're talking about a king here who... We would, from what we know about kings, he could have had his pick of the litter. You know, he could have had any young woman he wanted, and we know that's not uncommon with kings, no matter how old he happened to be. Why? Why is Sarah particularly a seductress for him, if that's what she is, if she's sixty-five to seventy years old? Well, to be courteous to our sixty-five to seventy-year-old listeners here, we should say that number one, there are many women who, in their sixties, are very beautiful women you know, and are still very attractive. I'm going to lay out three possibilities here. Uh, number one, the first possibility is it just, despite her being 65 to 70 years old, even the way we think about 65 to 70 year old women, they can be very beautiful. As a matter of fact, my mother um, is a woman who is in that age bracket, and yet she is praised all the time for her beauty. Now, you might expect I would say that about my own mother, but at least as of the recording of this podcast, uh, my mother's in that age bracket. And I get all kinds of comments about the beauty of my mother. Everywhere I go, oh, your mother is just so stunning, so beautiful. So it just it could be the case that just Sarai being in this period of her life, she just happened to be that beautiful. That's not unheard of even in our day. Uh, with shorter lifespans. On the other hand, a second possibility might be that since we know that Sarai lived to be 127 years old, she lived a lot longer than people typically live today or that people live at all today. You know, um, So if we think about her being at the midway point of her life, she might have been uh, in appearance at about the midway point of her life. That is, she might have looked about like we would look at a woman in her late 30s or early 40s. In which case, there are a lot of women in their early 30s and early uh, late 30s and early 40s who are very beautiful and kind of, you know, are looked at as, uh, you know, actresses and models and stuff who are uh, looked at as obviously the epitome of beauty. So that would that would resolve the concern. Um a, th a third option has been put forth by some, especially considering later on this happens again when she is much older than this. Some have said, well, maybe she's just has, God gave her a supernatural ability to remain visibly younger, you know, looking, even though she was older, her, she had the body and the appearance of a very young woman. Now, I, I find this one to be a little bit far fetched, partly because I think if that were the case, the Bible would. Uh, make that a little more clear because that would be a an incredible miracle uh, 
uh, you know, it wouldn't just tell us the, the implications of what happened. It would, I think, make a point to tell us that uh, she kind of had a fountain of youth sort of situation because that would be a, a very interesting thing to point out, you know. Uh, but um, some would say that she, you know, maintained this appearance of a very young, uh, fertile, attractive, gorgeous woman all the way up into her death, you know. Maybe. I, I don't personally take that approach. Uh, I said I was going to give three options. I'll give you a fourth option. The fourth option would be that when the Bible says she was beautiful here, that it it doesn't mean it in the way that we think of beauty uh, in our time. And I also don't mean that it means that she was beautiful on the inside. Uh, I don't I don't think that's what it means either. Uh, but uh, we should point out that the word that is translated here, beautiful, is translated elsewhere in Scripture for that kind of beauty, that's the aesthetic beauty that you might think of. It's also used of cattle, for example. Um, it's used in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 2 uh, for the cattle that were um, the appealing cattle in Pharaoh's dream that Joseph then interprets for him. So it, it could be that, that what it means, and some scholars go by this route, certain, seems to be the impression of the um, commentators in the Bible background commentary of the Old Testament, that it means um, that she was, you know, a woman, you know, it, it means like fine specimen, like she was a fine specimen of a woman. If we imagine Abram and all of his uh, group coming through wearing fine robes and uh, maybe all kinds of ornate, uh, you know, accessories and things like that, then you you might think that this king is what his servants told him was, hey, there's this woman out there and she looks like a beautiful example of uh, a great example of a reputable noble woman who it would be good for you to perhaps or even for a political alliance to to uh, take this woman as one of your wives, uh, something like that. That is a possibility. So there's four possibilities for understanding this. Um, uh, you know, it's it, I, I don't know. I think in this story probably it's uh, talking about uh, a beautiful woman in the traditional way we think about that, that Sarai was just a beautiful woman. On the other hand, because if it was just that she looked like a regal woman uh, or a noble woman or a quote-unquote fine specimen, well, then in that case, all that Abram would have had to do if he was worried about the fact that she was his wife and how they would think about this is he could have just kind of dressed her down, so to speak, you know, <laughs> riches to rags sort of thing. Uh, since that's not the case, it seems to me that what we're talking about here is just genuinely a beautiful woman. It's like I said in the last lecture, you know, some things in the Bible are just strange enough that they're true. You know, some things in reality, in reality, the Bible is reality, but some things in modern day, everyday life are strange enough that they just happen to be true. So that's that's uh, what we can say about that. Um, also, then it tells us that because of this, uh, Pharaoh was kind toward Abram. But then, verse 17 says, But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Now, remember I said a moment ago that Moses probably couldn't help but think about Egypt in his day, same Egypt, uh, different Pharaoh, but Pharaoh taking God's bride, Israel, uh, into his house, and then plagues coming on him because he won't let them go, right? And here we see that same thing happening here. So there's a bit of a motif. Um, there's another motif we'll mention here in a second. Um, I don't know if that was intended or not, but I can't imagine Moses writing this without having that, without thinking about that. Um, the, the plagues came because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then verse 18 says, Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Okay, so as we finish out this section, we see that these plagues came on this Pharaoh because of this. He d it doesn't tell us how he found out that... Um, this was, in fact, Abram's wife. We don't know. Some commentators try to speculate on that. Even the commentators I appreciate try to speculate. I think their speculations are too speculative, um, so we won't go into that. 
I just think it, uh, we don't know. You know, the Bible just tells us that he found out and he was bothered by this, obviously because of the plagues. And he goes to Abram, he says, take your wife and get out of here. So they get, and they, they, he gets his wife back and they go. And that brings us to the end of chapter 12. And so in summary, there, there are a couple of uh, things that in terms of thematic things, in terms of motif that we could mention. One thing is this parallel somewhat to what's going on in Moses' day or during Moses' life with the children of Egypt, um, or children of Israel in Egypt. But then also another thing that we should say is, uh, and this is pointed out by commentators, that it seems like that this story also presents attention, you know, when you're telling the story. Uh, kind of a shocking tension. Abram's just been told, in the same chapter at least, that he that God is going to bring a, a, a he's going to bless all the nations and, and he's going to be blessed because of this seed that's going to come out. And here, in me, almost immediately, this seed is threatened by Sarai being taken by this king in Egypt. So you have this tension there, and this pl- this happens again um, with uh, Abram's son Isaac. Uh, so we see this again, same sort of thing, a tension there. What's going to happen to the seed? How is this promise going to be fulfilled? Same thing with Abram trying to you know, handle things with Abraham and, and Sarai, trying to handle things with Hagar and Ishmael coming out. You know, what, the, the story of the seed is, is, is at the center of this. And uh, what is going to happen? How is God going to protect it? And as you're reading the story, you know the story so well because you've heard it all your life probably. But if you don't, if you didn't know the story and you were just reading it now, it is an emotional roller coaster as you're reading through. And I'm going to do this great thing and you're, and you're, I'm going to bring about this seed from you in your old age. And then almost immediately we have, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? That his, his bride has been taken. Uh, the mother of this seed has been taken uh, by this king. How is the seed going to come? And then, well, she's so old, maybe we do it through um, handmaiden, Hagar, and, and this uh, Ishmael that comes out of it. And no, that's, that doesn't work. Uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so it's just back and forth. And then even with Isaac, you know, how is the seed going to go forth? You know, It's again and again, it's at the center of what's going on. And it is an emotional roller coaster to fresh eyes. And so that sets us up for uh, some narrative things that are going to happen with the history of Abram in the coming chapters. So we'll end there with chapter 12 and we'll pick it up next time.